Okay, so welcome to the fourth lecture in CST 3205. And this lecture, I'm going to cover, cover Java. Um, so I'm going to start by making sure we're all on the same page when it comes to developing Java applications. So in uh, the previous, so last year, the computer science students are on this course. We've done um, Carl's Java course, CSD 2221, um, which taught you some stuff about, you know, using classes, using Java to pull out some data from uh, files, maybe do some basic processing on the data. So I'm just going to do some light sort of revision of that kind of stuff and make sure we're all on the, on the same page, yeah? Then I'm going to briefly show you about how you do use a debugger with Java, which will save you quite a bit of time and effort um, in the longer term. Then I'm going to show you how you unit test your Java code using JUnit. And finally, I'm going to show you how you can use Javadoc to generate uh, API documentation for your Java programs. And as you expect on my courses, uh, a couple of these things are, you know, um, have marks attached to them. Okay, so as I sort of briefly said already, you know, you've all done some Java, right? And you've learned how to write classes, I hope, how to have a main method, how to run those classes, and those classes have done some stuff using some of the built-in Java libraries. And that's uh, it's a good starting point, um, but Java is a really complicated language that has loads and loads of features. And, you know, when I did Java you know, in 2000 and whatever, sort of introductory to Java course, you know, I got to about the level where you're at with Java, I think, but I had no sort of conception of, you know, the richness and complexity of enterprise Java and the ways in which it's used. So there's even a word for the sort of level of Java that I reached uh, at the end of my sort of MSc, which is like, called, you know, plain old Java, right? It's a sort of slightly derisory term used for a sort of, even with an acronym, POJO, right? Which means, you know, plain old Java objects, you know, these sort of ordinary Java objects, which now you can all program. Um, but actually, once you get into sort of more enterprise Java, then it's all put together in all kinds of crazy ways. And I'm going to try and, in this course, introduce you to some of those ways. Um, but obviously, the starting point is being able to write POJOs or Plano Java objects. So the course assumes you've got the basics of, uh, you know, writing a main method, uh, types and variables, multiple classes, the methods, and, you know, basic exception handling. So if you're not comfortable writing Java code with these features, then I recommend you maybe go back a little bit do a little bit of revision, um, reread bits of the Liang book, because I'm in this course, I'm expecting you to be able to do stuff like that, yeah? So I'm going to give an example, um, which will illustrate all these features. If they're not familiar to you, you should definitely go back and, you know, get more familiar with them, yeah? So, you know, this is the book that Carl used on his course last year. I think it's a pretty good book as far as Java books go, um, so with lots of exercises. So if you are a little bit rusty on some of this stuff, um, have a little look, look at that book, I recommend. So for developing Java, um, you know, typically people use a development environment. So personally, I, I like NetBeans, um, which is should be installed in the laboratory machines. Um, it's got pretty good support for enterprise Java. So in another course I teach, um, you know, I had to do things like, you know, I had to sort of have uh, objects kind of managed on a server and then did pe dependency injection with these objects and this kind of stuff. And NetBeans kind of handle that beautifully, right? It'll handle serverless fine. It'll handle all the enterprise Java stuff. So that's why I like NetBeans. I mean, it obviously does all the basic stuff as well. You're welcome to use a different IDE or text editor or, you know, probably even use, you know, well, probably not use Word because you have all kinds of funny stuff with characters. But, you know, you, if you want to use Eclipse or um, IntelliJ, you know, that's fine too. But just take note, yeah, the IDE doesn't really matter, yeah? It's just a way of editing text, or editing text files, which in this case are Java files, yeah? And it gives you convenient stuff, like you press the green button and the stuff runs and it has the debugger built in and all the rest of it, yeah? But when it comes again to developing Java within a company, it's not going to be just you, the sole developer of your Java code, and it's all going to be inside this beautiful IDE and you press green button and off it goes and it's deployed on the server, right? You're going to be doing some bit of the project and maybe you use the IDE for that, it's fine. But the kind of building of the entire code base isn't going to be done in the IDE. It'll be done using a tool like Maven, something like that. And, um, you know, uh, you're just going to be using the IDE as a sort of fancy text editor. And that's all it is, yeah? So don't think that because you've mastered, you know, the, all the shortcuts in IntelliJ or because you're, you know, a super whiz at NetBeans, that that's going to help you get a job, right? I'd be very surprised if any employee really cared whether you use Notepad++ or, you know, e Eclipse or NetBeans or whatever, yeah? They've all got the same kind of features. They're just a fancy text editor, yeah? So, I mean, think of an analogy, okay? So, if I've produced, you know, uh, Tolstoy wrote War and, Pe uh, War and Peace, right? Great novel, but does anyone care um, whether he wrote it on a web processor, a typewriter, or, you know, uh, pen and paper? It doesn't matter how he wrote that novel. 
what matters is the quality of the novel, and the same goes for developing Java, okay? You, 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 the key thing is how well you write the code and understand the tools that are used to build that code, and an IDE is more likely, if you get hypnotized by the IDE, you're more likely to write bad code and not understand the tools properly. Whereas, you know, for example, later we're going to be using Maven, so yes, you can use some of these tools like NetBean to, you know, set up your Maven project, and, but if you don't understand how the POM XML file works, and just rely on the IDE to do all that for you, then you're not learning anything about Maven. And when it comes to running Maven, you know, in a different context, outside of the IDE, you're going to be totally stuffed, yeah? So by all means, use these IDEs, but don't believe that they're going to, you know, uh, you know, make your life, you know, super, you know, extra wonderful, yeah? Now, when you're writing Java, um, there are certain naming conventions that you should observe, yeah? And as a rule, you should always observe these Java naming conventions. Firstly, your code will look more professional. As I'm going to stress constantly in this lecture and elsewhere, other people are going to look at your code if you're working for a company, and because you'll be working a team, because you'll be leave your code for other people to continue after your death and all that kind of stuff. So it's really important that everyone, including yourself, um, can understand your code um, and will f find it easy to read, yeah? Also the case, that, you know, you might come with up with something that you think is like dead clever, some kind of super sort of massively compressed acronym for something really complicated, and you stick it in your code, and you're sort of really clear when you write it what that means, but I bet you if you came back to that in three months, you'd be looking in there, I've got no idea, and have no idea what that means, yeah? So stick to the Java naming conventions, you're going to have less errors in your code, your code's going to be more maintainable by yourself and other people, and I'm going to, I've stuck some marks in, um, into the coursework for observing the naming conventions. So there we go, a couple of marks for the correct use of Java naming conventions. So roughly speaking, these are the Java naming conventions. I'm going to give you an exception uh, a little bit later, um, but in general, stick to these rules, yeah? So always use camel case. So camel case means you've got like a capital letters, maybe, maybe in some cases at the beginning of the word, but always kind of in the middle. So you've got two words here, camel and case, and we're separating them not with a space, not with an underscore, but with a capital C. And we can use camel case in Java because Java's case sensitive, and I recommend the same for JavaScript. Whereas if you're using uh, MySQL, there's some you know risks that case sensitivity might not be respected, and therefore with MySQL or PHP, using an underscore and no capitalization at all. So classes and interfaces, um, we should do, class names should be nouns. So classes are so you can think of as some, it's an object, right? But it's also, you know, an object that represents a thing. So you should be able to give a noun name to your classes, yeah? Now the first letter should be capitalized, so this kind of class name here, or like my class, mountain bike, this kind of stuff. And as I sort of mentioned before, use whole words, not some obscure abbreviation, right? So if I was feeling dead clever, right, I might abbreviate mountain bike to M... T-N-B-K or something, right? And when I'm looking at that, you know, I'm writing it, I'm thinking, ah, ha, ha, I've saved myself, you know, 23, you know, 10 characters or something like that. How much faster will I be typing my code and all that kind of stuff? Great. Um, so maybe you save yourself a tiny few seconds of typing speed when you're actually typing mountain bike in your code. But when you come back to it three months later, you've got no idea what that means. You're going to be wasting, you know, an hour debugging it that you wouldn't have had to waste, yeah? So in general, Always use as much, be as clear as possible in your naming of things, and don't use abbreviations unless you really have to, right? If it was like, you know, 20 characters here, maybe we want to, you know, reduce it down to 10. And bear in mind that all you're saving yourself with clever abbreviations is typing time, which is really inconsequential. Most of the time you spend with Java development is figuring out what you're going to do and debugging it, okay? The actual typing of the code is a fairly minor part of the development process and has no impact on the runtime of the actual code itself. It doesn't matter if this is 20 characters or one character, it's not going to run any faster. Now your methods um, should all be verbs. So, you know, just to be clear, in Java you've got, you know, methods are uh, functions within a class, right? Whereas with uh, JavaScript you can have a function outside of the class, yeah? So a method is a function within the class. Names should be verbs because a method does something, yeah? It's like a function, it does, it's sort of active kind of thing. Uh, first letter is going to be lowercase, and so like change gear here or increase speed and so on and so forth. Uh, and just very briefly, I haven't put a slide on it, but uh, so if you have a public method, that method can be called by any class from any package. If you've got a protected method, that can only be called by a class, a different class within the same package. And if you've got a private method, that method can only be called by the class itself. Right, so then we've got variables, just keep the names short and meaningful, don't, short, don't shorten them with stupid abbreviations, just, you know, keep them short and meaningful. First letter, lowercase, 
don't start with strange characters. There may be some kind of weird, you know, Java framework that requires some kind of strange characters, but in general, just avoid it in your own code if you can. So just by looking at the variables, the casual user should be able to figure out why you've what the what the variable is actually doing. Yeah, again, it's all about readability, understandability, maintainability. Yeah, so we could have int speed equals naught, int my number, and so on and so forth. Now packages, I'm going to say a little bit of packages in a second, but they should all be lowercase names. Typically start with the top level domain name. So the point of packages is to wrap up a bunch of code um, in a way that it's not going to interfere with other code. So I might have, um, for example, I'm going to give you an example of a clock class, right? Just a sort of a simple illustration of a clock. Now, if we didn't have packages, I'd create my clock class, and then you'd create maybe your clock class, and we and we try and use them together, but we wouldn't be able to use them together um, because there'd be kind of name clash, right? I'd be trying to use clock, you'd be trying to use clock, we'd have the same names in the same folder, and it would just be a bit of a mess, yeah? But by having packages, we can say, well, this is all the code that's developed by me. This is the inside package one here. We've got EU David Gomez package one. I can put all the code um, that's like my code because it's got my unique domain name domain name attached to it, which is like the usual convention for package names. And then, you know, you could have your code, you know, com.example.whatever. And then we can have within these packages classes with the same names without any kind of conflict. Yeah. So that's the general point of having this package business. And then we've got a main method. So Java's got its own funny thing where you've got a main method and you can just stick it anywhere. It's got its own rules and syntax. And the main method is what's executed when the application starts. So because for clarity, I like to put the main method inside a main class, then I know where the main method is and it's super clear to everyone. But that's not you know necessary, but something I personally do and probably recommend. So you know the classic, you know, so you've got a class and we've got a main method, and then the sort of thread of the application will start here, and maybe it'll then, you know, launch some other classes and so on and so forth. So I mentioned classes, particularly this before, which bringing together classes and other things together. So something I should have mentioned, actually, obviously your classes um, have to be in a, class has to be, class has to be, the code for a class has to be in a, fo in a file with the same name as that class, yeah? So if it was like clock, class, then I have to put that clock class in a, in a file called clock.java with the same capitalization. Now packages, to so say bring things together, the package name must match the directory structure. Okay, this is the packages that, so the, like the name of the file and the name of the class have to match and the directory structure, all the folders and subfolders and so on, where, the, where that clock class java, clock.java is stored, has to match the directory structure, yeah? So if I want a package to create a package eu.davidgames.demo, then that package has to be in the folder, then the classes in that package have to go in a folder uh, demo that's in a folder David Gamez that's in a folder eu, yeah? So maybe, maybe I'll um, quickly show you that. Uh, so we've got my JUnit demo, so my source folder, I've got eu folder, it's got David Gamez in it, and then it's got the clock package, and then inside that clock package, I've got all these clock these classes for my clock package, and each of so clock has a class called clock in it, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So you've got the directory structure here, EU David Gamma's clock, has got a manage, map map uh, match the the package structure. Now, um, there's packages. Yeah. So typically, um, what you do when you finish developing your package, all the code's ready, it's all been tested, you want to release it, um, then you just compress it into a jar file, and then other people can link to that jar file and use your code. Now, if you want to just run package classes um, from outside the package, you can't execute them from inside one of the package folders. So again, just going back, to this, look at this little example here. So if I want to run clock, say, well, actually, let's go for the class stuff. I'll show you this actual thing in a sec, but... Right, so if I want to run... Uh, this clock class here, I can't run it from inside this folder. I have to run it from outside the package, and then I can say Java, and then, you know, it'll run clock if I do EU David Gamez clock dot clock, uh, and then it'll run the clock. Yeah, so you have to run the, run the classes within the package from outside the package. Okay. Now, when you're developing Java, um, if you're just using IDE, you probably won't have this problem, but in this course, you know, yes, you're going to use the IDE, but you're also going to have to do a lot of stuff from outside the IDE, okay? In this uh, uh, lecture as much as anywhere else. So Java is, the actual Java program is usually on the, on the path, and the path means, the, so when the operating system, when you type in a command, the operating system will look on the path and see if it can find an executable that matches the name of that command, okay? That's what the path is there for. 
So typically, Java will be on the path because um, it's installed in most systems. But things like uh, the sort of Java development tools are typically not going to be on the path. So we've got like Java C, that's the Java compiler, or Java doc, or this kind of stuff. So it might be set up correctly in the labs. I sort of suspect it isn't, but you know, maybe it is. It won't, and it probably isn't set up on your laptop unless you go into the trouble of setting it up. So in Windows, um, to do this, we need to add the location of the, the bin directory of the JDK. So the Java development kit has all these binary files, and we need to add that um, to, to the path so that the operating system, when I type in Java C, it'll look in that bin folder and it'll find Java C, okay? That's kind of how it works. So, so I can show you how it works. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Well, firstly, I'll show you the problem. So I think it's in here, probably program files. So if we go in program files, Java, here's my Java development kit here, and here's the bin folder, yeah. So here we've got Java C, that's the Java compiler, and Java docs. So these are the, you know, in this case, and Java, if I wanted to run that particular version of Java. But here I want to use Java C and Java doc, let's say. So I need to add this directory um, to the path so the operating system can find these programs. And to do that, we go into, uh, on Windows, and on a Mac, um, you'll probably have a, I can't remember what it's called now, there's some kind of configuration file, I'll have to look it up, and then you just add the path and it will environment variables in that configuration file, um, which the shell uses. Um, but in this case, um, we're on Windows, so we're going to do it uh, in Windows, we've got system, so this is to do it for all possible shells or any, anywhere in the operating system kind of thing. Then we've got advanced system settings, and we've got environment variables here, so these are the sort of local user ones, we could probably add it to the user path, but it'll be on the safe side, we could also add it to the system path, so then we click uh, edit. Now make sure you don't delete all of these things here, because if you delete any of these, it's going to um, base make that program inoperable on your system. Yeah. So here you can see I've added that path that I found to the Java development kit to the bin, so that now if I want to um, use Java C on the on the inner shell, um, then I can do that. Yeah. And this is sort of useful thing to do if it's your own computer. Um, because then obviously you don't have to mess around uh, doing it you know, by hand every time. If it's not your computer or using it in the labs, what you can do in the shell, um, you can, this is the Windows PowerShell, but the same, there'll be a slightly different command for the Mac shell, but it's a similar thing, yeah? So we can do echo, I always get this confused. So you've got the set of environment variables and path. So that's the path that's set up on this um, version of PowerShell. And what I can do is add very bits to the path. I can add here semicolon because all the paths are separated with semicolons. And then that's the location to my Java development kit. So I can add that to the end of the path uh, using this command here. I don't need to do it with my system because I've, I've sort of done that already. Okay. Right, so that's the sort of the background, the basics. Um, now I'm just going to show you um, a simple Java example that's going to illustrate the level of Java that's the starting point for this course. So as I said, this should all be easy to you, right? You should be able to write a program like this in an hour. It took me about an hour to write this program, you know, because I, well, I sort of had to figure out, you know, uh, some kind of sensible example that will, you know, that uses multiple classes and this kind of stuff. Um, but you should be able to put something together like this in an hour, and I'm going to get you to do that as a lab exercise, um, it, you know, the sort of lab, lab exercise that accompanies this lecture. This is a clock program, so it's a model of a clock, right? So we've got a clock, we've got hours, minutes, seconds, these are like separate classes that go inside the clock, and a main method that executes the clock. So just to talk you, I'm not going to talk you through every class because they're all the same and it's kind of boring, um, but just to show you the sort of thing, here we've got our seconds uh, class, um, which is in the file seconds Java. So firstly, it's in this package, eudavidgamez.clock. So these are all folders, and the actual seconds.java is in the folder clock, which is in the folder here, which is in the folder here. And then um, we've got a, this is where I'm breaking my um, Java conventions rule, right? So when you've got something like a static final thing that's never going to change, um, sometimes people, including myself, put it all in capitals with underscore separation to, to indicate that this is a fixed variable that's not going to change. So people often use pi in this way, or in this case, I've got max seconds. So the max number of seconds in a minute, which is what this represents here, is never going to change. So just to indicate that, I kind of like using this capitalization notation, and, and a lot of other people do as well. So don't worry if you break the Java conventions with something like that. But do worry if you break it elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, you know, elsewhere I've got, you know, I've got the correct class name, convention, you know, all the rest is fine. But just, just to, you know, illustrate what I'm doing that. Then I've got a very local variable, uh, variable in my class called seconds, the whole number of seconds, because it's like modeling the number of seconds. Um, and then I've actually got the, the empty constructor, sets it to zero. 
And then my seconds, minutes and hours methods of uh, classes all have this method tick. Because remember it's a clock, so we want to be able to advance the number of seconds as time progresses. So it's very simple, it just checks to see, increase the number of seconds, and sets it back to zero um, when, it go, when it overflows the maximum number of seconds. And then I've got some getters and setters, so I can you know, set the seconds against seconds. Minutes class is the same, except it's got minutes here, max minutes, and it ticks and it increases the minutes. And hours is the same here, yeah? So very basic, easy classes. I'm just using this as a simple example. Then we've got our clock class. Now the thing about the clock class is um, it's got these other classes as, as uh, variables within inside it, right? So we've got an hours class inside our clock, we've got a minutes class, we've got a seconds class. And the constructor basically you know, creates new instances of these uh, classes. Then our clock tick method, um, what it's doing is it's ticking the seconds, checking to see if those seconds have uh, overflowed or gone back to zero again. If they've gone back to zero, so we need to tick the minutes, right? And if the minutes have overflowed, um, then we need to tick the hours. So in that way, um, we've got a model of a clock, and each sort of tick of this clock would advance the seconds, minutes, and hours um, appropriately um, so that it's, uh, you know, uh, operates like a normal clock. Now I've got my set time method, yeah? So it's... Uh, so firstly, take note um, of the exception here. So I've got methods, I've got, uh, not methods, sort of bits of code here that check to see, che that check that these vary these um, arguments are all sensible, yeah? So if the hours is set to 105, then that's out of range, yeah? It's out of the range, it's like, it's greater than the max hour, so it's gonna throw an exception. And that's what we want, right? If we've got another program that's trying to set the time to something that's not, that's invalid, we wanna throw an exception. So having the throws exception here declares that this method throws an exception. And then we actually throw that exception if they're invalid arguments um, to this method. And then all it does when it's checked all that is it actually sets the hours, sets the minutes, sets the seconds. So the general point um, probably worth touching on here is the more error handling you have in your code, um, the better it will be. Your code will never, code never works smoothly. Always, no point in being optimistic, right? Always assume the worst, run as many checks as you can, and then you're going to pick up errors very soon instead of getting really obscure bugs that, you know, propagate throughout your code, yeah? So this kind of thing is exactly what you should do every time. You should always check that the inputs are sensible and throw exceptions if they're not, or some other form of error handling. You know, always build error handling in at every stage, and your code will be much more reliable and much easier to maintain. It's worth the time, believe me, yeah? Then we've got the main method, yeah? So, firstly, um, I wanted to have a third-party library um, in this... Uh, in this example, um, for a number of reasons, um, but because, and also because in a lot of your, uh, for example, the web scraping or with JUnit, we've got a third party library we need to use. So we're using a third party library here. Someone else has released this jar file, um, which contains this logger. I'm using this logger here, so I need to import it here. So in NetBeans, I mean, you have uh, like a bunch of libraries, library folder, you can sort of right click on that, you can click add jar, and then you can add this, this jar file to the libraries. Um, and then NetBeans will find it, and, I'll, and uh, you obviously need to add it in a different way. I mean, with Maven is the best way to add these things when you're building it with um, building it properly, because Maven will manage all the dependencies for you and make it much easier. But with NetBeans or an IDE, you need to specify the libraries that are required to build the project. So I'm using this third-party library, which will create a couple of problems when I'm running it, as I'll show you. Um, and then the main method is very easy, just creating a clock, setting the time up. Um, you know, remember this method throws an exception, so we need to have a, surround it in a try-catch block. You know, we could do something a bit more clever than printing the stack trace, but, you know, that'll do. Um, and then we're going to advance the clock um, and output the results. So we're just doing clock tick, which will advance the minutes, seconds, hours. And then we're using this logger here to output the, the current time, yeah? And this is what we get. If we run it, we get, like, info. That's the logger's output. That's what we're outputting here. That's the time. I should have put 01 or something. Never mind. So let's go 012, 314. So you can see the minutes are ticking along very nicely. And then this is just saying which class has generated that info log message. Now to run the clock from the command line, we have to change it to the directory that holds the package. And this is going to be in build classes, so NetBeans chucks all the things in build classes. When we're in that directory, we need to... Now, if we didn't have tiny logger, we could just type java uh, eu david gamma's clock main. But because we've got this third-party library that we need to, um, that the that the this clock class needs to run, we need to specify the class path. So the class path is the, all the paths. It's a bit like the system path, the environment variable system path. Um, so Java, the Java virtual machine will scan the class path to look for all the all the libraries and classes that it needs 
you know, to, to, when it's looking for the tiny logger, it'll scan the class path. So we need to add this tiny logger to the class path. So what we do is here's the, we're going up a few directories. We could have had the absolute path here. And tiny logs just says it'll add all the jar files in the class path, um, uh, you know, to, to the class path. And then it'll do um, semicolon because that's how they're separated. And then dot because we also need it to look in the current directory um, for the classes um, that are going to run this program. Yeah. So that's why we've got this class path variable here. And then, so in the IDE, as you know, it's dead simple. So here's our clock class. I think we just press play. And you can see it's running. There's gone through like 100 iterations of the ticking of the clock. And if we go to uh, the command line, probably got it here somewhere. Oh, we're in the wrong place anyway. So let's just, let's just do it properly. So we do go up and then um, you need to go in the build directory. And then and probably go into classes, I'm guessing. Uh, uh, right, okay, so here we are, yep, so here we've got EU, so that's the start of the package folder structure here. So now we can do, now we can bung in this command. Um, now take note, um, this will probably not work, actually, because I had, I had this problem before, because I'm copying this off a slide. If you copy stuff off a slide and stick it in, oh, it's working. But I, I did have a problem earlier, well, I think when I was generating the Java doc, I was pasting stuff in off a slide and it um, had a different character, even though you couldn't see it was a different character, like um, PowerPoint, it generated a different character, so it didn't run. But this is, this is running fine, so we've done class, 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 blah, 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 and then it's executed the thing, yeah? But you have to, you know, so that's all worked nicely. So, Java, you know, particularly when you get into some of the enterprise stuff I'm going to teach this term, is not trivial, yeah? Um, the lab sessions are there to help you with your programming. I'll do my best during the lab sessions to give you a hand, yeah? And if you want to spend more time in Java in the Q&A sessions, you know, I can run through code examples or whatever it needs, yeah? More than happy to do that. So I strongly recommend you attend the lab sessions, ask for help, of course, you know, there's 20 of you, whatever, and there's only one of me, but I'll do my best uh, to, to give you the support that you need, okay? But you've got to ask for it, or otherwise I can't help. Okay, next topic, so that's giving you the sort of background level of Java I'm expecting. So the next thing I want to cover is debugging. So when I started programming, you know, I typically uh, use like system.outprintline to output information and track the progress of the program. And in many cases, that's, I still, I, I use that sometimes still because I'm, I'm kind of lazy. Um, but also I use it, but in the case of a multi-threaded program, actually system out print lines better in some ways than debugger because trying, because a debugger works very nicely on a single thread. It's a bit more tricky to use on multiple threads. But with a single thread, debuggers are just amazing. Okay. It's just quick and easy to use. So I'd strongly recommend you have a go with a debugger and just see how easy it is. And that probably convince you that writing all these system out print line statements is, is, you know, just a waste of time really. So with a debugger, what you do is you add breakpoints in the code. And then you run the program in debugging mode. The um, program's execution will stop at the breakpoints. Um, and then you have the option, you can either step over the breakpoint, step into a method, step out of a method, view the values of the variables, and resume execution of the program. So it's a great way of running the program at your own speed in a way that you can actually look into the program and see what it's doing. It's, it's just, you know, debuggers are good. Okay, so I'll just show you with my clock class. So here's my main method, right? So Doing this stuff, so to, to set the breakpoints, I can just click here in the num in the on the numbers, and you can see here we've got a breakpoint. So what it's going to do when I run it in debugging mode, it'll stop at that point and give me then full control of the execution program. So this is normal execution. But we need to run it in debugging mode here. So now it's debugging mode. So it started the program up, and it stopped to that breakpoint. Okay. Now here we have a set of pro. Um, set of, you know, buttons, whatever, that lets us do different things, right? So I can step uh, step over, maybe that doesn't execute it, not sure. Anyway, don't really use that one much. So we, it's a different kind of step over. Anyway, um, so if we step over, it just means we sort of uh, let it execute without stepping into it. Well, I'll show you what this means anyway. So we step over, right? We stay in the same place, same method or whatever, and we just let it execute, and it just does it in normal normal way, yeah? Now, as we do different things here, we'll see um, we've got the variables here, which which we can look at, yeah? So with system out, I'd have to mess around doing all this, and I wouldn't be able to um, stop the program and see how the and the variables change. But with the debugger, we know exactly where we are. We're here, um, and we've got hours. So we can see this is these are the three classes inside my clock class. We've got hours, minutes, and seconds. Um, and so inside my clock class, I've got hours, and inside hours, I've got this hour variable, and that's currently set to naught. Minutes, minutes is naught as well, and seconds, uh, seconds is naught too, yeah? 
Now if I step over clock set time, well actually I step into it, that's probably better. So now I step into this method, and you can see now we've gone into set time, and now we're running these checks, blah blah blah, which we don't really need to worry about, so we can just step over that stuff, we're not interested in that. And then we've got uh, hours, uh, so hours, it's sort of pulled out the ones that are relevant, but here, let's just look at it here. This is the hours class, this is the hour inside the hours class, and it's currently set to zero. And you can see we can then uh, step over that, because I don't really want to step into it. And now we can see that hours is set to 23, okay? Whereas the others, minutes and seconds, are still set to uh, 59.34. Uh, yeah, what's that? Uh, oh no, minutes, so I don't know why there's a set to that, but minutes is still, the minutes class, minutes inside minutes, which is the one we really want, is actually still set to zero. That's correct. And if we step over that, now it's set to 59, and we, step, and we can actually... If we're bored of stepping over this stuff and we've, we've done with this, it's all working, we can then step out of the method and then that takes us back up to here. So at the end of the try catch block, we finish setting time and now we can continue setting, uh, stepping over and we can, you know, step over, we can work through the 100 iterations of this loop if we're feeling super keen. And if we're bored of that too, we don't need any more de debugging, we've worked out how it's all, it's all good, then we can just press the green button here and it'll finish the execution of the program. So it's super easy and really, you know, it's great for seeing what's actually going on the program as it runs. So for some time dependent stuff, you can't necessarily do this kind of debugging, but if it's not like that and it's not threaded, then it's fantastic. Right, so the next part of this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, JUnit, which is the unit testing framework uh, typically used for Java. So as you know from last year, but just to refresh your memory, um, unit testing is just an automatic way of checking the functionality of individual uh, methods and functions, yeah? So there's a whole software development methodology called test-driven development, um, where instead of writing the code and then testing it, you use the uh, unit test to kind of specify the program, uh, maybe you've got some software requirements, so you have some requirements for the, for, the, for the application or piece of software, you turn those into unit tests, and then you actually write the code that passes those unit tests. And when you ship your code, you can also use the unit tests as a sort of specification of the functionality of that uh, piece of code you, you've shipped, it, you, that you've uh, developed. Yeah, you can say, well, here's my code, and here's the unit tests that show that this code actually passes the specification that you, that you required, yeah? As I mentioned to you before, um, they're also used the unit tests are a crucial part of developing software in large teams. So this is exactly what I did, you know, this time at Trinity Mirror when I was working as a software developer. And so you've got a big team and a huge code base, right? And some small, some, some person within that team is given a small piece of code um, to develop, fix, improve, or whatever. So suppose we've got a developer who's given uh, the sort of string processing library that they're using for, you know, whatever, um, to, and to do some rewriting and add some functionality to it. Now suppose that developer breaks the string processing library. Now they may not realize that it's broken. Um, they may even have some unit tests that all pass on the string processing library. But the changes that they make to that string processing library might affect another, another piece of code elsewhere in the system and completely break it and make it inoperable. Now you can detect that instantly if you've got unit tests that are run across the whole system um, whenever something else, something is checked into the repository, right? So this, this developer checks in his changes to the string processing library, they rebuild the whole system using Maven or whatever, and then they'll run all the unit tests against that system. And while the developer wasn't aware of the functionality that they're breaking elsewhere, the unit tests that are run across the whole system once it's been rebuilt will instantly pick that up and you know you can then fix the problem. Otherwise, if you didn't have complete unit test coverage, you know, you might make a change to one of the libraries that might break something elsewhere, you wouldn't know about it, you end up shipping buggy code, your website would crash and all the rest of it, yeah? So it's an extremely important part of developing software in, in a large team when everyone just works on little bits of that software and then checks the changes into a repository, which is the typical way these things work. Now with unit testing, it's pretty easy um, to write unit test methods that are doing a modular function. So if I've got a function or method rather that adds two numbers, um, then I can just write a unit test for it dead easy. But even with our clock class, um, it's not so easy to unit test the clock thing as a whole. I mean, we can um, because it kind of creates its own uh, classes, but in, in some, in some, in many situations, you have a, a class that depends on a really complicated class um, that needs to be in a particular state for the other class to work. Yeah, or maybe you got. I gave you the example last year of PHP, where you had like a dependency on a database. So to unit test my PHP database code, I had to put the database in a known state, then run my unit test, and then reset the database afterwards. So you often have to rewrite your code to make it enable to be tested. 
And in the cases where you've got one class that depends on another complex class, you often have to do what's inject uh, what's called a mock object, which is a sort of simple version of the class that another class is dependent on, um, that will sort of behave in a way that makes the unit test possible. That's what a mock object is. Um, and that would, so you inject this mock object into the class you're testing, and that will enable you to test the class that you're testing, yeah? It's a bit of a, you know, it can be a bit tricky. I'm only going to cover the basics here. To really cover mock objects and injection of mock objects, I need more, better examples and um, need to spend much more time on it. So I'm only expecting you in this course to do basic stuff, yeah? So what we're going to use is JUnit, which is the unit testing framework for Java. So those of you who are doing um, Franco's course um, will be introduced to JUnit and use it a lot, I think. Um, but since most of you are not on Franco's course, you know, I'm going to explain how you can use it here. So I think it's pretty sure it's a standard unit testing framework for Java. So JUnit 5 is the latest version, you know, there's like unit 4 or whatever. And typically used to test the functionality of individual methods, yeah? So to create our first test, um, we need to download the JUnit libraries. If we're using an IDE, we need to add these libraries uh, to the project, you know, using that thing I said where you can add jar or folder. Or if you're using Maven, you just have, Maven's so beautiful, you just add a little, you know, that much XML, um, and then it just downloads them all for you. Then you compile the tests, compile the classes you want to test, and then you run the test. That's the general sort of workflow. Now, JUnit is based on Java annotations, and um, a lot of the sort of more advanced Java frameworks are also based on Java annotations. So you probably haven't come across annotations, um, but we're going to be using them for JUnit, we're going to be using them for Javadoc, we're going to be using them and for Spring and Hibernate as well. They're all based on annotations, and if you ever use Java Messaging Service, that's also based on annotations. So it's a sort of a big thing in Java, um, this kind of annotation notation. So all we need to do to use it is to use the at symbol, and that doesn't go in the code, it goes sort of outside the, the method. Well, it's in the code, but it's not actually, it doesn't have any functional role in the code. The code just runs, it's more like a comment, but it's a sort of smart comment in the sense that it tells the framework or library or whatever, you know, that this method is a unit testing method, for example. We can apply annotations, classes, interface, methods, variables, comments, and so on. So in the case of JUnit, we're going to use the following, you know, it has a lot of annotations, but these are the sort of core ones, right? So we're going to use display name, because we're going to give each test a particular name. That, that we can use this annotation to specify the name of a test. These annotations are used to specify that the methods are executed before all of the tests, or before each of the tests. Then we got the test annotations specifying the methods of test. And then these are sort of cleaning up kind of methods that can be executed to specify that this method's called after each test or after all of the tests. <gasps> So let's um, write some unit tests for our clock class now. So all we're going to test, um, let's say, is the set time, the tick, and the get time. Now, because our uh, our unit test is written in a, is, I'm going to put it in a test package. Sep keep it separate from the actual code that you know the the operational code. So it's going to be in a separate package, and therefore, if I want to test set time, I have to make this a public method. Yeah, otherwise, my clock class, my test code, isn't going to be able to call the set time method on the clock class. Right. And so here, and then so I've done that. So here we have our J unit test for the clock. So initially, we've got the uh, at the beginning and end of this, we're using the annotation here. So that's all an annotation looks like. It's just the at, and then you know this is particular J unit annotation. And then we're saying that these are the methods that I'm putting anything in them, but these are kind of the methods that are called like before the test, all the tests, or before each test, and then after each test, or after all tests. So sometimes you need to sort of you can have a single. Uh, object and then you can like reset it for each test and maybe that's more efficient if it's complex objects and like that or if we're testing a database um, before each test we might want to like empty the database or something like that yeah and then we have the actual tests so this is an example of a test so we're using the test an annotation to specify that this method um, is a test method yeah I don't think uh, yeah oh yeah sorry I missed one here so we actually also have a display name here um, at the top of it all saying test clock that's like the name of the all of the the sort of this group of tests, yeah? Okay, and then so you have test, and then so this annotation say, is saying that this, this test seconds is a test method and should be executed by the testing framework. Then we're going to give it a name. The names are very useful because as you'll see when we actually run these tests, you just get the sort of output and you need to know which, it's, you can make it much clearer which test is broken um, if, you, um, if you give it a display name. Then the test itself is like exactly like the PHP unit tests I taught you last year, or the Q unit tests, it's the same idea. So we create a clock, 
we set the clock into a known state. I mean, here we've got a sort of dependency between um, this method and the method we're testing. So we're testing tick seconds, but we're using this method. It's not ideal. Um, might want to rewrite it at some point, but it'll do for the moment. So putting the clock into a known state, and we do have a separate unit test for this anyway, but, you know, I'm not certain about that. Anyway, we're putting this clock into a known state, so it's 0, 0, 59. And then we're going to call tick. And then we're using these assert equals, and there's lots of other of these kind of assert statements um, with the built, built into JUnit. But in this case, we want to say that the clock get time is equal to that time there. So this is what we're expecting the state of the clock to be. And then we're checking that the actual state of the clock matches the ex expected state. And if it doesn't, then it's going to throw an exception and break the test. Yeah. So very easy to write these tests. And same thing here. So we've got a clock, is new. so this is like testing set time method, so saying that there are, we're expecting the clock to be initialized in like 0, 0, 0. Then we're setting it to a particular time and checking that the time that the clock actually is matches the time that we're expecting. So all the tests kind of work in a similar way. Now, so, so we've written our tests, we've got our separate test class in our test package. Um, now we want to run these tests, yeah? So the best way, by a long way, to run this stuff is using Maven, because then it can just run the test before it actually builds and deploys, before it deploys or packages um, uh, the application. So Maven's the best way. I'll show you how you can run these tests in Maven when I, in the Maven lecture. There is a, some way of using these kind of tests within IntelliJ and Eclipse. I haven't bothered looking into it, because um, uh, NetBeans apparently doesn't seem to support it, but uh, I don't really care about the IDE stuff anyway. But I will show you how to run these tests on the command line. Because it's conceivable um, that you'll decide that, you know, you're really keen on writing the test, but you can't be bothered to use Maven, and you're just willing to lose five marks for that, okay? So I'll show you how to use the command line as well. And later, yeah, I'll show you how to use JUnit with Maven. So to run JUnit 5 tests on the command line, we use this uh, program called Console Launcher. Now, I have to say, Console Launcher is not very good, right? It's not very good because it's got lousy, um, when, when it doesn't, when it goes wrong, it, it breaks silently, and it's really difficult to figure out what's going wrong. So I must have spent two hours of my life uh, suffering with console launcher and trying to get the parameters right and not understanding what's going on. But I think I figured it out. I think I can help you use it if you want to use it. But I can't. I have to say I'm not going to be heaping praise on console launcher in this lecture. Yeah. So console launcher is a program that runs JUnit tests and then just outputs the results. So it's a standalone jar file. That means it's got all the dependencies packaged up inside it, so you can just run it like any other application. So the first thing to check is that your test has compiled, because NetBeans, at least, it'll build the main application, but it won't necessarily build the tests. So I wasted an awful lot of time running console launcher, um, you know, and it wasn't running the tests, and, I, and that was because the test hadn't been built. So check the tests are compiled, and I'll show you what happens if that's not compiled. Then you change to the root directory of your project, and run this, this command with the appropriate parameters, for you, because you, your project might look a bit different, so obviously you've got to tweak these parameters a little bit, yeah? So first we've got java.jar, .jar. so I've, I've kept, uh, put the console standalone launcher or whatever inside my bin directory, which is up and down one directory, so that's where I've got this dot dot bin thing. Um, so that's basically the path to my standalone, you know, console launcher thing. And java.jar .jar will cause, will execute this particular jar file, yeah? Then we've got class path build test classes. This is where I've got my, uh, the classes that I want to, that contain the tests. And here I've got the classes that I want to test. And then here we've got scan class path, which is saying it's got to like do some kind of recursive search on these two class paths in order to find um, both the tests and the classes that are going to be tested. That's the idea. And if it goes well, um, you'll see something like this. It'll sort of, you know, um, do this and blah, 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 and it'll tell you it started the test. And if the test passed, you'll get the four tests successful here. Yeah. So. Let's try and get this running on here. So let's just see where we are. Now I've got to remember the root of the application, right? So let's go up. Uh, okay, so I've got it here somewhere. Same as I'm typing it all in. Uh, okay, let's just check that's right. So we've got the... So this is the command that I just showed you on the, on the slides. And yeah, it looks all right. Let's just try it. Okay, great. So it's found the classes, um, it's executed the tests, and it's all looking good, yeah? Now, so that's passed, right? If it looks like that, it's passed. It says four tests successful, and there's no exception thrown at the beginning. Now, if we go for our test, which is a set in a separate package, where it's gone, uh, test clock. Now, let's just change this to 13, let's say, so that in this case, clock get time, this, sh this, sh this should not match that, and therefore the test should break, yeah? So save it. 
And then this is the bit I've struggled with a little bit with builders. So we need to, I knew that bit was a problem. Uh, so save. So I had this problem before. Uh, we need to compile the package somehow or build this file. Uh, and I had this problem before. So we need to compile the file. Let's try, let's try F9, but it's not building it. So you need to make sure you build it. Otherwise, um, we're going to have problems. And that's what I'm just trying to solve because I had this problem before. I knew I'd have this problem when I demoed it. Uh, maybe if we go like somewhere else. It, it was just a bit... Maybe if I clean it, that might help. Uh, Okay, so let, let's completely build every, rebuild everything, yeah? And then maybe it'll let me build the, rebuild the file. What I need to do is build this file, and it's not, for some reason, whatever, it's not a, it's not very happy about that. So this, so I've done clean and build or whatever. Now maybe it'll let me um, build this file, yeah? Uh, okay. Um, compile file, right? Okay, I had to be on the file, in the package trash or whatever. If I don't build it, it's not going to give me the latest version, right? So, and then it's, so if I run it now, um, it's probably just going to pass. Yeah, or it's, or it's going to, yeah. So, so this is an illustration um, of what happens if it can't find the file, yeah? You get no test found, no test skip, whatever. So I cleaned it and I rebuilt it in NetBeans, but NetBeans didn't build the test file, yeah? And this was the problem I was struggling with this console launcher. It doesn't give you any error, it just gives you this stuff, yeah? You can't find any tests and you're like, why can't it find the test, yeah? The reason it can't find the test is because you haven't built this file. So if we build this file now, compile file, um, then it gives you this, you know, slightly different errors. So I know it's built. Um, these are just warnings anyway. Now if I run the tests, um, what we're getting is it's finding the tests because we've got four tests started. And we've got three tests successful and one test failed. And it's failing. It's telling us here, you know, uh, the test class or whatever, and the method that's failed and so on and so forth. So I've changed it. And if I change it back, save it, um, and I have to be there for some reason. Uh, so I can compile the file, build the file again, uh, fix the test or whatever, and now it's passed, yeah? But if you see this, um, that means it's not finding it and you've got something wrong with your class path. And it can be a bit tricky to fix. Okay, so there's five marks for unit testing in coursework one. Um, one mark per test, and as usual, you know, you lose half of those marks if, you, if your code isn't passing the test. And you need to document... Um, the results of your tests, um, which can be, it's fine if you just document them in the way I just showed, and then I can look at your code and see that it passes, yeah? Now, as I said, as I explained before, I'm not expecting you to inject mock objects or any of this kind of stuff. Unit testing can get complicated. I'm only expecting basic unit testing in your coursework, yeah? Um, so you could test some of your web scraping, your database, your utility classes, that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's um, unit testing, and now I'm gonna explain how you can do API documentation. So as I've stressed throughout this lecture, commercial world codes developed in teams, developers code maintained by other people long after developers left, right? You'll be dead and your code will still be floating around in some enterprise, you know, repository. So, and also um, when you're building Java code, people often release uh, software libraries for other people to use. So in this, uh, in this uh, lecture, we've used TinyLog, which has been developed and released by someone. And we're using JUnit and the standalone console launcher. All of these are Java libraries that people are releasing for other people to use. But if you want to use a library, you need to understand how it works, right? You need to know that this method does this, or you know, this class does this, and so on and so forth. So to help the people who are going to use your code, you need to have systematic documentation of that code. And this is where Java.doc comes in. So it's an easy way in which you can generate complete documentation of the API uh, from the source code. So it'd be a real pain if having written the code, you then had to sit down and you know write this enormously long document um, listing all the methods and explaining how they all worked, right? It'd be, you know, no one would bother doing it. But by using Javadoc, you can just write your comments in a specific way and then run Javadoc on your code and it will generate all the documentation automatically in a nice, easy to use way. All you have to do is add these special comments to the parts of the code you want documented and then run the Javadoc tool on that and it will automatically generate a website with the API documentation from those commands, from these comments. So a lot of you have looked at the Java API and this is generated using Javadoc. So the special thing about Javadoc comments is they start with slash star star and end with a star slash. 
So which is different from ordinary comments, which are either like the double slash comments or the slash star star slash. So all these kind of comment will be ignored by JavaDoc. It'll only process comments um, that look like that. Within these JavaDoc comments, you can use annotations to add things like parameters, authorship, and so on and so forth. So here's our clock class. And so if you look at my clock class, I've kind of got this JavaDoc um, comment style and my little comment saying what the uh, clock does. It's not the most brilliant comment in the world. And then I've got, you know, another JavaDoc comment there. These are not Java comments. So these comments will make their way into the API documentation and these ones won't, yeah? We can also use JavaDoc, uh, we can also use annotations um, within the JavaDoc comments. So here, this is the best way to do um, Java, JavaDoc uh, methods. We've got three arguments here. And so someone who's using this code will, will want to know what the three parameters are and maybe the range of these parameters and so on and so forth, which I should have put here. So you just use param here in the Java doc. And then when the Java doc reads this source code, it'll know that our, it'll put these comments into the appropriate part of the um, website that's generating. And we can also give some Java documentation for the conditions of, under which it will throw the exception. So this is the, you know, a good example of how you should do Java doc annotations for methods. So javadoc, once you've done all these comments on your source code, which is no more work than doing ordinary comments, um, then you just run it on the command line. So you change to the parent directory that contains the packages that you want to generate documentation for. You decide where you want it to be stored, otherwise they'll just chuck it and probably mix it in with a source code or something. So I use a doc folder. And then you just select the D option. So again, if you're using Maven, you don't need to bother with this. It'll generate documentation for you. But, you know, since we're, I'm just showing you each of these things separately as well before we go into the whole Maven uh, sort of stuff. So here we've got an example, we've got Java doc dash D that's saying this directory, all the Java docs should be stored in the doc directory. And then this is the package that we want to generate documentation for. And then when you, when you run this command on my clock class, you get this generated documentation here. So if we go, so if you look in, in my class where it's gone, right. Okay. So we go J unit demo doc. It's currently empty, right? Now, save myself a bit of time, might be able to find my javadoc thing because it's kind of broke last time. So yeah, there you go, javadoc-d, doc, doc blah, 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 blah. And if it works, uh, no source question. Oh yeah, so we need to be, one minute. Uh, maybe I need to be in source. Oh yeah, I need to be in source, yeah. I need to be in source because it's going up a directory to get the doc, right? So let's, let's, try, um, let's try that. Okay, great. So that's worked. It's giving me like building tree, generating, blah, 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 blah. So now if we look in our doc folder, it's generated this documentation. We can double click on it and it launches up this lovely, beautiful looking API documentation for my clock class with very, very little effort. Yeah. The only effort is I had to comment my code properly, which I should have done anyway. And I just had to use the special way of commenting my code um, that enabled Java doc to find it and generate this document here. And that's very nice, you know, stuff. So in coursework, I'm expecting you to, in coursework one, possibly in coursework two, I haven't decided yet, and then Mark's are generating API documentation of your code using JavaDoc. There's fancy stuff you can do with JavaDoc. I'm expecting you to use it in a basic way, such as the way I've just shown you now, yeah? So there's four marks for that, it's quite a lot, so for such an easy thing, but obviously it's also expecting you to make sure your Java code quality is up to spec so you can actually use JavaDoc properly. So just to recap, if you're rusty on your Java, it's been a while, um, then maybe you'll find this book useful. I think you still should still have access to it, but there's plenty of copies in the library if you don't, and you could probably read an electronic version through the library website. So I've given you plenty of resources. So all of this stuff are covered in this lecture. You know, there's like tutorials and guides and resources there. Um, we've got the obviously recorded lecture, but we've also got the example code from this lecture is all here. You're going to need the tiny log library to run it unless you get rid of that. Um, and then I've got the the unit J unit file, jar file for building the, the unit tests and then the console test runner for running the unit tests. So this lecture I covered the level of Java that's the starting point for this course. I've explained Java API documentation, unit testing with JUnit 5 and debugging. And the next lecture will cover threads.